um, uh, thought I'm talking about the other arm of the CD4 cells. Um, so not about the helper side of the CD4 cells, but the uh, effector side of the CD4 cells. So when we think about CD4 T cells, we all agree that they are very important for the immune system, that they are critical for the coordination of the immune responses, for the orchestration, and we, are, we know that they are somehow important for vaccine design. <clears throat> but um, what they do and how they do it actually is a big black box. So we don't really know how they are contributing to the prophylaxis uh, mediated by a vaccine, and we don't really know how they are involved in the clearance and control of, for example, viral infections. Now, what is clear that when we, from the 26 studied licensed vaccines, we know that 24 of them induce neutralizing antibodies, and it's pretty obvious, probably from all the talks before and uh, from the studies that has been done, that CD4 T cells are involved in, uh, that, that, uh, sorry, that neutralizing antibodies are involved in the prophylactic effect of a vaccine. However, virtually 100% of all the st uh, studied vaccines induce CD4 T cell responses. Now, what they're actually doing, we don't know. We, is it safe to assume that the T follicle helper cells, like uh, um, Rick had talked about earlier, um, play a role in the vaccine-induced protection? But we don't know if they do uh, not also have other roles in the protection or in the clearance of viral infection. So. When we think about CD4 T cells in terms of vaccine design, of course, the first part what we're going to think about is the T follicular cell plus cell arm, the help for the uh, B cells uh, that they are providing the induction of somatic hypermutation, the affinity maturation of the antibodies, and the maturation of the B cells into long lived plasma blasts or memory B cells so we can have a long lived response towards the antigen. We also know that CD4 T cells are very critical for the help for CD8 T cells. We know that in the absence of CD4 T cells, uh, CD8 T cells are less efficacious and are less able to provide help to, um, uh, less able to respond in a secondary recall response to the antigen. So the memory formation for the CD8 T cells is very critical, uh, for the CD8 T cells is very critically dependent on the CD4 help. However, CD4 T cells can also kill virally infected cells, and that has been known for a long time, but it is not really a, a topic of uh, research. Uh, and especially in the CD4 cells, cell field, there's this dogma that CD4 T cells are the helpers, while the CD8 T cells or the NK cells are the effectors, right? But I'm going to show you a lot of data, and only on the effector arm of the CD4 cells, that they're actually contributing to the control of viral infection. And uh, I hope I can uh, convince you at least a little bit that they are also involved in the control of HIV infection. Right. So why don't we study more uh, the HIV, the effective side of the HIV-specific CD4 T cells? Well, one, one problem was basically Danny's study. Oh, now he's listening. <laughs> uh, well, it is not, nothing is wrong with the study. This is actually a wonderful study, but it's basically how it was interpreted afterwards. So what he shows here in the slide is um, that uh, he studies 12 uh, individuals and shows that uh, the HIV specific, so, so the cells, the percentage of infected cells is always higher compared to the memory CD4 T cells. And, um, there, uh, it's quite striking, and uh, uh, when you plot it a little bit differently, I didn't put that slide up, it's, it's significant. So there's always a higher number of infected cells uh, in the HIV-specific CD4 T cell compartment compared to the memory CD4 T cell compartment. However, when you take a close look to the axis, it's actually only 0.1% to 5% of the HIV-specific CD4 T cells that are infected and uh, consecutively depleted. In other words, 99.9% .9 to 95% of the HIV-specific CD4 T cells are not infected and not depleted. And Danny actually writes that in the paper in like a small sentence at the end, but um, um, that, that didn't catch the attention of uh, most of the readers. And so all the data was completely right and the interpretation of the paper is right, but the perception was wrong. And therefore after that, uh, not only because of that, but there was not much uh, research for a while on HIV-specific effector CD4 cells. So um, 
we did a couple of years ago a first study just asking the question, what is the contribution of HIV-specific CD4 T-cells to the general immune response? And so we did just a simple interferon gamma early spot assay and asked the question, well, what is targeted and what is not targeted? Just to remind, uh, remind you, we looked at the, just here at the breadth of the HIV-specific CD4 T-cell responses versus the viral load in those individuals, and we see like a modest, inverse correlation uh, to the breath with the viral load. So basically having more HIV-specific CD4 T-cell responses is slightly associated with the lower viral load. 10 years ago, before that study, there was a study in CD8 T-cells, uh, also looking at the numbers of the HIV-specific CD8 responses and the viral load, but they didn't find any association uh, with the viremia. Now, when we look where the CD4 T cell responses are, or targeting the proteome, it is actually very interesting because we see uh, three clusters uh, of uh, the HIV specific CD4 responses. On the one hand side here in P24, the super strong HIV specific CD4 responses, 50% of all tested individuals make this one response, all P41. We see a cluster in P17 and in F. And then nothing really happens in that area, but we see another cluster here in the GP120 and in the MPER region. And I'm not talking about the envelope responses, but it's, what is interesting about that, just to follow up on Rick's talk, there, uh, th the areas where there's heavy glycosylation, there's really no CD4 responses, with the exception of V2, where we have a lot of HIV-specific CD4 responses there. But nothing in V1 or V3. When we now look on the level of control, the dark blue patients are the patients with elite control. They all basically have their responses here in the P17 and NEF region, but barely make any responses in GP120. The ones that have a little bit higher viremia, up to 2,000 copies per ml, they kind of have like a balance between the P24 and the envelope responses. Now those that have a really rapid disease progression, so very high viral load, they actually have barely any P24 responses, but see very strong uh, GP120 responses. And it almost seems like a shift, right? So it goes from uh, the P24 targeting, the GAG targeting in the ones that are controlling to the envelope targeting in the ones that have rapid progression. And when we just plot the GAG versus envelope ratio, um, you see that this is actually a nice indicator of the level of control. So the patients that are very well controlling have a very low envelope to gag ratio, so barely make only gag, while the ones that have a very high envelope to ratio, gag ratio uh, have a, a high viremic progressor and uh, are the ones that are rapid progressive. Now, this is in chronic HIV infection. And for us, for us, the question, well, is this now a cause or the consequence of viremia? Right? You, you have, because you have only so much more viremia, that's why you're seeing more uh, envelopes or inducing more envelope-specific responses, and the P24-specific responses are more depleted. So we asked the question, when, when during the course of infection is this actually, uh, this association of GAG and envelope within the HIV-specific CD4 compartment is actually developing? So we wanted to look at uh, acute HIV infection, where we had a total of 55 uh, subjects that were mainly enrolled uh, uh, during FIBIC 2 and 3, and then we had a few in 4 and 5, uh, but I show you that this actually does not matter that much. All of them were male, Caucasian, MS MSM. Um, um, no, all were male, the majority were Caucasian. Sorry, I have to read this table myself. And as you can see here from the uh, clinical data, they had very high uh, viral load in acute infection, the FIBIC 2 and 3, and then leveled off. I'm uh, insisting on this uh, FIBIC 2 and 3 just to remind you this is just a staging system of acute HIV infection. There were other staging systems before, we are like the ADRIP staging. Uh, there's a new one suggested right now. Um, but basically what it is is when you can detect what kind of antibodies in the uh, serum or what part of the HIV can be detected in the plasma. So it's pure clinical staging system, but we use it as a guidance to, to uh, stratify our patients in, um, in similar patterns so we kind of know uh, what we are comparing to each other. 
So FIBIC2 and 3, this is a point where the viral RNA and the P24 antigen is detectable, but the Western blot, so no serum conversion basically occurred. Um, now, let's look, we also, uh, what I showed you, earlier, if you remember the uh, proteome targeting uh, in chronic infection, we saw the clusters in GAG and we saw the clusters in envelope. Uh, and therefore, because we didn't have so many uh, uh, specimens, so many blood specimens, we decided to cut out the middle stretch and only look at GAG and NEF and envelope for the targeting. Now, let's look at the very first time point. So in the FIBIC 2 and 3, at this time point, what the HIV-specific CD4 T cell responses uh, are detecting and what frequency of the responses we are uh, able to measure. And we, are really, we were really surprised about that because what we saw was uh, this pattern that we saw very strong, like almost 60% of the individuals made this one response in uh, P24, and then we had strong responses here in the OLP91 and a little bit lower in uh, the OLP301, and then, of course, like the OLP6 and OLP37. Now, that must remind you of something, because when we look in chronic infection, um, we see exactly the same pattern of the HIV-specific CD4 responses. So at the peak of viremia, or do, uh, around the peak of viremia, we already see the same pattern of the HIV-specific CD4 responses emerging that we uh, cross-sectionally can also see in the chronic phase of infection. Now, we followed our patients longitudinal from acute to one year out. So let's see how this changes over time within the same individuals. Uh, no, this is cross-sectionally, but what you can see is basically over time, we see exactly the same pattern of the HIV-specific CD4 T cell responses at baseline, two months, six months, and 12 months post-infection. The graphs look a little bit different, especially towards the 12 months, because patients dropped out, had to go on treatment, etc. So we had over the time a loss to follow up. So the next question was, okay, when we have this loss of the HIV-specific CD4 T cell responses, or that, that it's driving the beginning of the um, uh, acute phase of the infection, we must see a contraction of the breadth or the magnitude of the HIV-specific responses. Well, this is the data a longitudinal and uh, uh, cross-sectionally of the patients. The gray dots are the FIBIC 5 and 6 that are identified a little bit later in infection, and the other ones are FIBIC 2 to 4. Uh, but what you can see, the breadth of the HIV-specific CD4 responses from baseline to 12 months post-infection is not significantly changing over time. Here we have the ability to make a matched pair analysis to look at the same individuals where we had the, measured the CD4 responses at baseline and where we are able to measure the CD4 responses of the same individuals a year later. And as you can see, uh, there's no significant difference in the breadth of the HIV-specific CD4 responses. Now, there is a trend towards a decrease in the general breadth of the CD4 responses. So I'm not saying they are not depleted and not disappearing, but the, so there is a trend of a decrease. But you have some individuals where it uh, basically st remains qualitatively uh, stable, but in others it's increasing. And basically the same applies for the magnitude. We have, over the time, no change in the magnitude of the, or total magnitude of the HIV-specific CD4 responses. So from baseline to chronic infection, we have cross-sectionally no change in the magnitude of the CD4 responses. And also when we were in the matched pairs where we had at the baseline and 12 months post-infection, we do not see a significant change in the total magnitude of the CD4 responses. Now, again, as you can tell, probably, there is a slight decrease. So there is a trend of a decrease in the magnitude, but it's not significant after one year compared to baseline. So the next question, obvious question for us was, is there any change in the protein dominance or what kind of the HIV is being targeted? And to make a long story short there, um, basically at uh, no time point we observed between in the matched pair analysis is it the magnitude, breadth, or the contribution to the total number of the HIV-specific CD4 responses? So basically the relative dominance between GAG or GP120 or NEF, we do not see any changes over time in, in terms of GAG, uh, in terms of uh, dominance, the breadth, or the magnitude in the matched pair analysis. 
Now, I showed you earlier in the chronic phase of the infection that we see this very clear indication of a uh, clear indicator for uh, disease progression having a low uh, or a high envelope to gag ratio. So targeting more gag is better for disease outcome. And it looks like when we go back here that we have the same pattern in acute infection or in chronic infection already in acute infection. So our question for us was, does this actually indicate us um, already in acute infection the outcome for the chronic phase of the infection? So can we see this indication already during the FIBIC 2-3 uh, stage at baseline? And uh, we think we actually can. Here, when we look again at the contribution of the GAG-specific CD4 to T-cell responses, we didn't have, of course, so many high numbers uh, that, uh, because of the loss to follow up, but we see a significant association between the virus set point in the chronic phase of the infection and the contribution of the HIV-specific CD4 responses towards GAG in the, at baseline in the acute phase of the infection. And we also see it saw a trend for the opposite direction, having a high contribution to the, of envelope-specific CD4 responses. We see that having an acute infection, more envelope-specific CD4 responses, we have overall uh, a trend to a higher virus set point. We chose also a different readout. We thought, okay, well, viral load might be not uh, uh, the overall best readout in clinical, uh, in human studies, so we asked the question, when did the doctor decide to put those patients on therapy because of CD4 count, viral load, or other factors, but, um, um, like how the patients feel, etc. But we wondered what, what the, uh, whether this is the high levels of gag responses or high levels of envelope responses is somehow also, uh, 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 um, we, we can also see the levels of disease progression in terms of when the patient had to go on antiretroviral therapy. And indeed, when we stratify bet between gag specific or envelope specific responses or high number of gag responses, those patients had, uh, 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 were put on heart much slower than those that had more envelope-specific CD4 T-cell responses. <clears throat> so here was our question whether this is in any way genetically determined. So Ken Rock gave a beautiful introduction to the whole uh, MHC field. We are, um, from this part, we are, of course, only focusing on the MHC class 2 pathways, in particular HLA-DR, because this is one of the most uh, polymorphic part here. But, uh, so we are own, wondered whether this interaction and what the CD4 teasers are seeing is driven through the HLA class two pathway. So what we did, we created over 200 HIV-specific CD4 teaser lines and uh, clones and uh, tested those against the panel of 38 L cells that were singly transfected with one HLA class two alleles. And here you see basically the same map again that I showed you earlier, but on top of that, you see the uh, HLA restricting, restriction that we determined for the individual HLA class 2 alleles. But when we zoom in, we see actually that there's this really high level of promiscuity of HLA class 2 restriction um, for one single epitope. So one epitope can be restricted by multiple, multiple different HLA class 2 alleles. And in fact, um, we tested only 38 out of a I don't actually know how many there are, but um, so we, we, it's very obvious that we probably missed most of the HLA uh, uh, class two um, restrictions that are possible for a single uh, HLA class two allele. So now on the one hand side, we have the strong protein specificity. And on the other hand, we see this like mess of HLA class two association where we have like one epitope being able to be restricted by so many HLA class 2 alias. But actually within this uh, level of promiscuity, we saw a pattern, namely that some HLA class 2 alleles were restricting for, uh, for a lot of the HIV-specific CD4 T-cell responses that we were able to determine, while other HLA class 2 alleles were barely contributing to the HIV-specific CD4 T-cell response. So we had some HLA class 2 alleles that were contributing a lot to the CD4 responses, while others were contributing very little. So 
we wondered whether this is in any way, this level of contribution of the HIV-specific CD4 responses is, is, is in any way um, is in any way associated to the level of control that might be through help or direct mechanism coming from the CD4 T cell responses. So what we did, we went uh, through a cohort with Mary Kang to a cohort of over a thousand HIV infected, uh, chronically HIV infected individuals and uh, uh, where we got HLA class two high resolution typing form and all the analysis were adjusted for HLA class one alleles, so HLA B57, B27, those alleles that have been associated with HIV control. And we just wanted to ask the question, are there any HLA class two alleles in any way associated with HIV control? Now it's important to note that the big genome-wide association studies, they have all shown it is only, they have only ha all had one hit, right? This is uh, the HLA B57 or MHC class one, but in, in particular HLB57. So in there, in those genome-wide association studies, there was no association with HLA class two. However, we didn't look genome-wide, we just asked the question whether there's within the HLA class two alleles a trend for a, a, a higher level of control or lower level of control. And indeed, we found that some of those HLA class two alleles, like here, the HLA DRB50 node two, is associated, is rather associated with uh, a lower hazard ratio, so slower, uh, a slower disease progression, but others, the HLA-DRB1 or 301, is associated with a rather rapid disease progression, so higher levels of viral load. And indeed, the, uh, after multiple comparison, DRB1-1502 and DRB1 or 301 is, was uh, still sig statistically significant. So in this completely independent cohort, we asked whether our HLA class two alleles, like the upper quarter versus the lower quarter, is differently contributing to the HIV-specific CD4 T cell responses. I've shown you earlier like this uh, trend that some HLA class two alleles are rather contributing a lot to the HIV-specific CD4 responses, while others are barely contributing. And we asked the question whether those are more contributing to the HIV-specific CD4 responses versus those uh, that are associated with a higher viral load. So here's the data for the ones with high viral load, and you see that they have an average 25, a uh, restrict for 25 of the de uh, detected HIV-specific CD4 T cell responses, and uh, uh, GAG, but with a higher number of envelope and a little bit of uh, the accessory proteins. In contrast, those that are associated with a low uh, odds ratio, so better disease outcome and lower viral load, has, uh, have statistically significantly more HIV-restricted CD4 T cell response, in particular GAG and NEF, and you can see here that they are also restricting for less envelope-specific CD4 T cell responses. But what was also striking, that those HIV-specific CD4 T cells, or those HLA class two alleles that were associated with better disease outcome, were actually uh, restricted or were actually uh, binding those um, uh, peptides in a lower, uh, lower functional avidity. So in an LE spot uh, uh, serial dilution, we found that they were actually less, uh, had a lower functional avidity and um, compared to the ones with a high odds ratio. And I'm showing you now, this all uh, might be a bit confusing, so I'm showing you a model of what we're working off, trying to understand whether this is the underlying mechanism. So on the one hand side, we have the CD4 T cell responses that are binding in a high functional avidity, but less promiscuity, um, and we believe that they are probably becoming more activated and reach a certain CCR5 threshold and might be dying of activation-induced cell death or HIV infection. So the ones that are binding with a high functional avidity and less promiscuity are associated with a higher viral load because they are uh, or more likely to die uh, because of a higher level of activation. In contrast, those that are associated with the low odds ratio we think they don't reach this low activation threshold and might be preserved, but they don't reach this level of activation to undergo AACD or HIV infection, they might be still able to perform their antiviral function. To show you that in a different uh, way, so we think that there might be a CD4 optimum, where those CD4 T cells uh, 
that are less, um, that have a higher promiscuity and less functional avidity can provide their help uh, in an, uh, at the CD4 optimum where they are not getting infected or die of activation. So to conclude this first part, I've shown you that HIV-specific CD4 T cell responses uh, are detectable in the majority of the patients, even in chronic progressive infection. They emerge early in infection, and we were honestly surprised about that data ourselves because we, we uh, were completely blinded. That was done in, uh, two, by two separate groups, um, and we see the same frequency, breadth, and magnitude uh, compared uh, to chronic infection in already in acute infection, already at FIBIC 2 and 3. And we also see that the early recognition of GAG by CD4 T cells already during acute infection is associated with a lower viral load and slower disease progression. Um, overall, we see that there is between the HLA class 2 alleles, there are some HLA class 2 alleles that are associated with better disease outcome. But those that are better disease outcome, they are binding also restricting for more HIV-specific CD4 T cell responses, but show in general a lower functional avidity. Now, I've earlier talked about the effector function of the CD4 T cells. And just to reiterate, so I'm talking now about the killing of the uh, mediated, the antiviral function mediated directly by the CD4 T cells. And just to say this again, it is really not a new concept. There have been studies in 1979, I think there's even one earlier, that, that suggested that CD4 T cells, or at that time CD4 wasn't even defined, that there is a class II uh, reactive cytotoxic T cells that are able to kill uh, with a less, uh, less, uh, less strong than the CD8 T cells, but are able to kill in an HLA class II dependent fashion. And also, it is not, nothing, uh, not necessarily something new for HIV infection, but it has been shown here in human influenza infection that pre-existing cytotoxic CD4 T cell responses are associated not with protection from infection, but when those individuals were infected with influenza, they showed uh, uh, basically better disease, overall disease outcome, faster clearance from infection, so illness duration was lower, the total symptom score uh, was lower, and here as well. So uh, this paper, I really like this paper from Wilkinson because it shows you that this is an association with cytotoxic CD4 T cells, as you can see here, uh, against flu and uh, um, flu peptides. You can see that the cytolytic CD4 T cell responses are the ones that are associated with the uh, control of infection. In HIV infection, we see when we clone our CD4 T cells, our HIV-specific CD4 T cells out, here you can see 28 uh, clones. Uh, you see that only a fraction of those CD4 T cell responses have actually the ability to kill in a cytotoxic, uh, cytotoxicity assay, like here the chromium release assay. So this is about 20 to 30 percent of the HIV-specific CD4 T cells, and maybe that is not the best picture for that, but we also have about that 20 to 30 percent of the CD4 T cells in the blood show perforin and granzyme staining. But I'm going back to that uh, a little bit later. What we have also found is that in elite controller, we generally find more of the HIV-specific cytolytic CD4 T cell responses. So those that are able to control viral replication, we find more. We find more of those cytolytic CD4 T cell responses compared to progressor. So we wondered whether the HIV-specific CD4 T cell responses directly contribute to the viral control. So what we did in this experiment, we chose two uh, cohorts of individuals that had high viremia that was not significantly different at baseline and was not different at the two months time point. But then something happened. So one group started to control viral load while the other one had about a log higher viral load. And that was at the six months and 12 months time point statistically significant. It's also important to note that the CD4 count was at no time point between those groups statistically significant different, but showed that the 12 months time point was trending to a lower CD4 count in the ones that were not, uh, that had a higher viral load. So if you now look at the degranulation ability of the HIV specific CD4 T cell responses in that, 
in those patients. So that when, when the CD4 T cells or T cells are ejecting the effector molecule, the death molecule like perforin or granzyme, they bring vesicles to the front that are coated with LAMP1 or LAMP2 that we then can measure as CD107, as LAMP1 is CD107A or CD107B, LAMP B. Uh, now, in the ones that are, uh, have uh, reached a high virus set point, we see that the HIV-specific uh, uh, degranulatory CD4 T cells uh, have very low levels and then decrease to lower levels and then uh, are really at the very low levels of detection. In contrast, those that are reach a high viral, uh, the, the, that are able to control viral application to about a log lower, we see at the two months and six months time point, a significant expansion of the degranulatory cytotoxic CD4 T cells. And it's important to note that this actually happens at the time point where we do not see any differences in the viral load. So at this time point, we see this emergence of the HIV-specific CD4 T cell responses with this, um, um, with this particular functions. So we next wondered whether those cells are able to kill virally HIV-infected cells. So we uh, used uh, this virus suppression assays where we um, differentiate macrophages and uh, infected with a VSV HIV um, uh, set as green virus, uh, also VPX to get higher levels uh, of infection, and added only for 36 hours uh, CD4 T cells um, to see whether in that time they are able to suppress viremia. We get high levels of infection with this virus, so here 93% of the mac macrophages are infected, but when we titrate in our CD4 T cell responses, we get a suppression of the HIV, HIV infection in the macrophages. And here, again, you see that we have an effector to target uh, uh, um, ratio with increasing effector to target ratio, we see an increase in the virus suppression mediated by CD4 T cells in the macrophages. And when we do the same experiment with HIV negative individuals, of course, we do not see any effect. So this is not non-specific, so we have here specific effect. We also generated, of course, clones. I showed you earlier a little bit of uh, the data. Uh, when we here infect just H9 cells with the virus, we need to see nice viral replication over time. But when we add our CD cytotoxic CD4 T cell clone, we get a um, two log viral inhibition uh, in our assay, and we can block uh, the interaction between TCR and HAA class 2, and um, the uh, viral inhibition of the CD4 T mediated by the CD4 T cells is almost completely abrogated. So showing that there's an HLA class 2 dependent effect of uh, CD4 cytolytic activity. We also see that the clinical outcome in those patients is dependent on the presence of uh, uh, those cells or uh, here the, the granzyme expression in the CD4, HIV specific CD4 T cells, where we found that those that have low granzyme A levels um, uh, had CD4 count uh, were uh, progressing to disease much slower compared to those with high granzyme HIV specific granzyme A uh, positive CD4 T cell responses. And this is about a an average a year later of disease progression when we measured at this time point high levels of the HIV-specific granzyme A positive CD4 T cells. And then we also, when we used a different readout, like antiretroviral therapy, when the patients were put on heart, a similar study as I showed you earlier, or when the viral load reached oh, over 100,000 copies per ml. So, here, I hope I can could establish a little bit that there is a clinical li link to the presence of the cytolytic CD4 T cell responses that we are detecting already early or emerging already early in a, a acute infection. But our next question was, what are actually those HIV-specific cytotoxic CD4 T cells? Um, there's, they have been around a lot uh, as an idea, and there have been consecutive studies, but we wondered well, we wanted to systematically assess what are those HIV-specific cytolytic CD4 T cells. So the first thing what we did, we stimulated uh, CD4 T cells with GAG and then sorted based on the uh, uh, surface expression with capture assays uh, 
um, which was a little bit finicky uh, because of uh, the use of monensin. We either captured the CD107A interferon gamma double positive cells or the interferon gamma positive cells. So either the ones that we here define as our TH1 cells versus those that have cytotoxic ability. And then we did uh, uh, RT preamplification and uh, did basically a single uh, cell fluidine analysis or in other cases 96 well fluidine analysis and compared the um, CD107 interferon gamma positive cells, so the ones that have cytolytic activity to the ones that only secrete uh, interferon gamma and uh, looked at the mRNA uh, uh, expression profile but we also compared those to the CD8 T cell responses, so uh, the cytotoxic CD8 T cell responses. When we here look at the panel of our genes that were uh, significantly regulated, you can actually see very nicely that the ones that we here define as, I, as our cytolytic, HIV-specific cytolytic CD4 T cells, that those are the ones that express the granzyme, perforin, and uh, perforin and the transcription function eom eomesodermin. By the ones that are, um, oh, I actually have that animated. <laughs> By actually the ones that are um, uh, only secreting interferon gamma are rather the ones that are also expressing other uh, transcription factors like GATA3 or expressing ICOS, IS-16, IS-7 receptor and others. So this is from the mRNA transcription profile where we see that, that those are really the ones that are expressing the uh, granzyme and perforin. So we wondered whether this is also from the protein level, uh, uh, the difference in those cells. So do, do they also show the same profile from the mRNA expression on the protein level? So we uh, did a couple of uh, flow cytometry experiment and we found again that the granzymes are expressed in the ones in the interferon gamma CD107A positive cells in higher levels. And we found also uh, higher levels of perforin, of course, but uh, that we can define those cells from the surface markers for consecutive experiments through the surface markers CD57 and KLRG1. And we uh, identified our TH1 uh, cell marker because this is going the other opposite direction as the CD161 positive cells. So one question, of course, what is a, a, a transcription factor for cytolytic CD4 T cells? Um, that is something what we are still working on, but what I can show you and what has been also shown in uh, mice, basically that the cytolytic CD4 T cells have to express TBET, but they are also expressing another T-box transcription factor, the eomesodermin, in higher levels compared to the ones that are only secreting interferon gamma. And uh, GATA3, of course, we found higher in the interferon gamma positive cells. So finally was uh, there the question whether they are, uh, how those cytolytic CD4 T cell responses compare to the cytolytic HIV specific CD8 T cell responses. And um, what was interesting for us was basically that they are um, in, uh, that they show this distinct, here in a, a, a principal component analysis, that they show this uh, distinct profile from the CD4 interferon gamma positive cells and compared to the cytolytic CD4 T cells, but they are, that they are also distinctly different compared to the cytolytic CD8 T cells uh, or the CD8 T cells in general. Um, but what was interesting is when we looked on the mRNA or on the, uh, uh, um, or on the protein level, we found that in a every case here in black is a CD8 T cells, that they, these are the ones that are more towards the direction of that the cytolytic CD4 cell responses are always more towards the direction of the cytolytic CD8 T cell responses. So it is, uh, they are always more trending towards the direction of the CD8 T cell transcription rate profile um, compared to the interferon gamma only uh, uh, secreting CD4 T cells. We also wonder whether they are infected and depleted in HIV infection, and uh, this is a little bit puzzling for us. Uh, we used five different uh, viruses uh, that are, um, are five tropic, and um, we sorted ourselves based on the uh, transcription uh, profile. Uh, 
protein expression profile that I showed you earlier, either the CD57 and KLRG1 as markers uh, for um, a pool of uh, cytolytic CD4 T cells versus uh, non-cytolytic CD4 T cells. But what we found is that the ones that have uh, that are rather in the pool of cytolytic CD4 T cells, here the KLRG1 positive or CD57 positive, show a slightly lower level of infectability here with the five different viruses. These are always in the match colors. And that the CD161 positive here for the TH1, uh, uh, as a marker for TH1 cells, show a slightly higher uh, infectability in our assay. Um, in, for the CD57, we saw the same trend, but that was not significant. Also, for the X4 viruses, we uh, did not see any differences in the infectability. It was only for uh, the R5 viruses. However, we tested all uh, possibilities of CCR5 expression to MIP1 beta expression or any of the trans uh, intracellular host restriction factors. We didn't find any uh, particular reason why the... Um, uh, cytolytic CD4 T cells should be less susceptible to infection compared to the Th1 uh, CD4 T cells. Um, I showed you earlier that they are uh, capable of, uh, CD, uh, of viral control, but now we wanted to put it in the context for the viral control that is mediated to CD8 T cells. So we used a, a, a viral inhibition assay um, uh, and uh, sorted our cells, cytolytic CD4 cells, on the markers KLRG1 or CD57. Overall, when we use other, CD, uh, other CD4 T cells, we see a nice, uh, 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 a nice uh, level of uh, infection. Um, but and when we add CD8 T cells to our assays, we see a nice uh, um, two-log viral inhibition. Uh, mediated through the CD8 T cell responses. Now, when we add um, uh, our cytolytic CD4 T cell responses, we see that they are also capable of viral inhibition, which is about like a log lower in, be and log in between CD8 T cells and CD4 T cells. And it fits very well actually to the data from 1979 uh, that has been published. Now, we of course repeated that a couple of times, and there the picture looks a little bit different. We have um, high, uh, we get, of course, high levels of infection in the target cells and a very good uh, suppression to our CD8 T cells. But if you use um, um, CD57 positive cytolytic CD4 cells or KLRG1 positive cytolytic CD4 T cells, we see that there's actually not much a difference in uh, the ability to suppress viral replication. We see the best viral replication in the CD8 T cells but uh, we see also very well uh, inhibition, uh, viral inhibition uh, by CD4 T cells. So we wonder whether the CD8 and the CD4 T cells can actually act synergistically or additive or cooperative in the control of, um, um, of HIV viremia. So what we did is uh, we infected our target cells, and here again you see our, in this experiment our viral inhibition to the CD8 T cells, and gave through this, to the CD8 T cells either CD57 positive cells or uh, KLRG1 positive CD4 T cells. And we see that we, we see an increase in the viral inhibition compared to the CD8 T cells in the presence, uh, in the, uh, presence of CD8 T cells and cytolytic CD4 T cells defined as CD57 positive CD4 cells or KLRG1 positive CD4 T cells. So this is the model we are working off for this experiment right now. Uh, we, uh, we are not doubting that uh, HIV-specific CD8 T cells are involved in the control of viral replication, but in the uh, case of escape, exhaustion, and immune evasion, be, um, where this recognition might be disappearing or might be less affected, we think that HIV-specific CD4 T cells must play a role in the control of viremia. However, also our in vitro experiment have shown that uh, besides the antiviral function, there's always a problem that the HIV-specific CD4 T cells can be infected. And then actually when we run out our viral inhibition assays to 10, 12 days, we get at one point, higher levels of infection 
in the ones uh, where we have only cytolytic CD4 T cells because they are getting, at one point, of course, infected. So we, but we think that there is a protective effect that is also mediated, or like a, 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 a control effect uh, mediated through the HIV-specific CD4 T cells. And also for the vaccine trial that um, um, uh, Rick mentioned earlier, I just wanted to mention as well that it has been shown in the RV144 trial that the HIV-specific CD4 T that showed, uh, just to remind you, that showed the 31% efficacy that there was, besides the non-neutralizing antibodies that were detected, that there was also, uh, that most of the CD4 T cell responses that were detected and cloned out showed a cytolytic activity. So what I've shown you in the second part is that um, the emergence of HIV-specific CD4 responses, but not uh, CD8 T cell responses, is associated with uh, a lower early virus set point soon after acute infection, and that is in particular the emergence of cytolytic CD4 T cell responses um, that are killing through an HLA class 2 dependent me uh, uh, mechanism is um, associated with viral control. I've also shown you that the cytolytic CD4 T cells are from the transcriptionally, functionally, and phenotypically different compared to the Th1 CD4 T cells. They show a level, lower level of infectability that we cannot explain right now, uh, but they are cooperating in the viral uh, clearance with the HIV-specific CD8 T cells. So, um, just to thank the people that were involved in this, um, especially now here at the end, but Susan did all the work on the, the last work on the uh, cytolytic CD4 T cells together with Sebastian. Uh, the acute studies were done with Heiko and Carmen in Berlin. Uh, Mary and Yuko helped us, and Alex, of course, with the HLA Class II Association, and Damien did all the first study that, I, that is already published uh, on the cytolytic CD4 cells, and Srin on the Class II Association. And thank you for listening. Hi, Hedrick. Very nice talk, as always. Uh, I was surprised to see that your cells also express, at least uh, in terms of RNA, IL-10. Did you follow up on that? That they express IL-10, yeah, the, the TH1 cells? No. Nah. I've got to look. Yours. Oh, those. No, we didn't follow up on that, no. No. Would be interesting to see is anti-inflammatory. Yeah, they don't express FOXP3, so if you're, that's the next question. Know, they they have been description of T-Rex express porphyrin. We don't see uh, FOXP3 expression in those. Okay. David, um, lovely talk, Hendrik. Glad you pointed out the error of Danny's good <laughs> paper. Um. <laughs> Um, so the virus is very good at telling us what it can't tolerate. So we look at envelope and we see enormous escape. We look outside envelope and we can attribute almost every change we find to something that is better for growth or to CPL escape. The data for, C for escape in helper epitopes is a single paper from some postdoc somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so wasn't I mean, me. <laughs> no, it was Joan. Yeah. Uh, so why do you see escape from CD4 cells? Or? No, but I, I think that the, um, um, I, I would be surprised if there is actually CD4 escape or much CD4 T cell escape. Because the, the setup of MHC class 2, and Ken can much better comment on that than, uh, uh, than I can, but the setup of MHC class 2 is, is not a groove, and it's, uh, it is wide open, and you can have secondary structures and even tertiary structures of the protein, and the CD4 T cells can still recognize it. It's also bound to several different uh, uh, bonds, hydrogen bonds, etc., that are, um, so where I think where one escape happens, that it does not necessarily uh, influence the binding to MHC class 2. It might change the binding overall or the affinity, but it might not uh, change the overall uh, binding. So what you're saying is that any mutation with a, within a class 2 epitope, there isn't a single mutation in a class 2 epitope that would evade recognition. Oh, I, I, think, I think there is, but I think overall it's much harder to find. 
uh, I think there might be there might be escape, and I know Philip Norris has data of like one in vitro escape uh, driven by CD4 T cells, but um, I think it, it will be much harder to escape from a class two epitope than from from a class one epitope. So the first part of the talk, when you did the um, uh, CD4 uh, recognition scan, and you realized that, that most of your epitopes were most of the uh, uh, most of the peptides were were very promiscuous. What do you take from that information? What I take from that from from information? From the pr promiscuity. Did you expect that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, is, it has been shown in many other pathogens that the HLA class 2 has much, or CD4 T cell responses in general have a much higher level of promiscuity. And, but it has been also shown for HLA class 1 that there's a, a level of promiscuity in the uh, class 1 binding. But from the class 2, I didn't find that very unexpected. 